Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. As human beings, we tend to be selfish. Let me say that another way. We tend to want what we want, and that is very dangerous when we study the Word of God. Oftentimes, and this is true for all people, we read a portion of Scripture, and even though it may say one thing, we hear something different. Why? We hear what we want to hear. And that is certainly the case in the passage of Scripture that we're going to look at today. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 15. Now this 15th chapter, this first section of it, is very well known. Many people go to it in regard to one particular issue. And what is that issue? Well, in Hebrew, we call it kashrut. You might know it better as the biblical dietary laws, what's oftentimes spoken of in English as kosher, kosher food. From a rabbinical perspective, what's permissible and what's not permissible to eat. Now, all of that stems from certain verses in the scripture. But here's what you need to understand. The portion of the Bible that we're looking at in this study has nothing whatsoever to do with the dietary laws, with kosher food. It says nothing about this issue. And here's the problem. When we look at the parallel passage in the book of Mark, we all know that in the Gospels, many of these events are recorded in not just one Gospel, but in two or three. So the events repeat. They are told by Matthew and Mark and oftentimes Luke as well. And many people, when studying this passage, they like Mark's Gospel because of what's said in Mark chapter 7 and verse 19. There, there's a kind of summary statement. And here's the sad truth. That summary statement, as it appears in the scripture, it does not say what traditionally, probably, your Bible states. For example, a very poor translation of the scripture is the New International Version, the NIV. And the reason why I mention it is that it is the most popular English translation for the Bible, for English speakers throughout the world, not just in America. And at the end of that 19th verse of Mark chapter 7, we find this statement. Thus, Jesus declared all food clean, meaning you can eat what you want. But here's the problem. That phrase, thus Jesus declared, isn't in the text. It speaks about something totally different, and we'll deal with that next week when we look at that parallel verse in Matthew's gospel. But I want to underscore, this portion of scripture says nothing. I want to say that again. This passage of scripture, whether we're speaking of it from Matthew's gospel or Mark, it says nothing concerning the dietary laws. Food is not at the primary concern of this passage. So once more, look with me to this 15th chapter and verse 1. We're going to see that the concern is ceremonial uncleansingness. That is, that which renders someone impure or defiled. But here's the important consideration. We're not speaking of that from a biblical standpoint. I don't know about you, 
But what is of great interest to me is what the Bible says. Not so much what other people say or other views of the Scripture. We need to be people that ground our faith and our behavior on the clear message of the Scripture. This argument that's taking place here between Yeshua and some Pharisees and scribes have nothing to do with the Bible. Did you hear that? This passage doesn't deal with an issue that is related to the Bible. What does it have to do with? Well, what's called in Judaism the oral law. That is what man wrote down in regard to his thoughts, his views, his understanding having to do with things related to the Scripture, not what Moses taught, not what the prophets revealed, and certainly not what the New Covenant authors wrote down. So let's begin verse 1. We read here, Then the ones from Jerusalem, the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, I emphasize here the phrase from Jerusalem for a reason. When we look at the biblical text, we have the definite article, the, referring to the scribes and the Pharisees. But interrupting the text is this phrase, from Jerusalem. So it literally says, the, meaning the Pharisees and the scribes, the, from Jerusalem, scribes and Pharisees. Now, why is that so important? Because when we look at it, literally in the Greek text, there is an emphasis on these individuals being from Jerusalem that stands out. And it's to speak about their authority, their statue within the community. These were important individuals. And what does it say about them? Well, let's look at that first verse once more. Then, and I'm going to translate it in a simple way, then the scribes and the Pharisees from Jerusalem, they came to Yeshua. So these individuals from Jerusalem, the scribes and the Pharisees, they came before Yeshua saying, and they had a question. And once more, it is necessary that we listen to this question and not infer from it things that are not based upon the text. What was their question? Verse 2. Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? Underscore that last phrase, the tradition of the elders. We are not talking about, from their standpoint, this question, the issue that we're going to be dealing with. It's not a biblical one. It is not related to the commandments of the Scripture, the laws of Moses. Rather, it's rooted in a tradition of the elders. Now realize something. The elders, they're different than the priests and the Levites. Or the prophets because the priests they were priests because they were born into that and that was based upon a biblical commandment likewise the Levites they served because of a divine calling the prophets they received the Word of God in a unique way God spoke to them and commanded them to write down their words words from heaven but the elders, they received their position because they were viewed by society. Yes, by the leaders, the chief priests, the, the, the Levites and others. They were viewed as godly men. People who had a proper reputation. People that could be relied upon. So they were affirmed by society, the leaders, but society at large, the Jewish society, that they were appropriate to be leaders. So they were called the elders. They were indeed older, 
presumed wiser and they had a good reputation among men and women. So this tradition derives from the elders. We could understand this as the sages of Judaism. Those that wrote down, and here's the key, not the law of Moses, but the oral tradition. It is a man tradition. Its source is man. And one of these traditions had to do with the real issue of this passage. And what is that? The traditional laws, not biblical, but traditional laws having to do with impurity, that which is unclean, that which defiles someone. Now, to understand this correctly, we need to press on and hear a very important statement. Once again, once again, they ask, why do your disciples transgress? From their standpoint, this is a sin. They transgress the traditions of the elders for they do not wash their hands whenever bread they eat. Now, bread, and we're not going to go into this, but from a rabbinical standpoint, from the perspective of Jewish law, bread has a very important, unique status. And when a meal concerns or consists of bread, there are different laws. Now, here's what they're saying. These scribes and Pharisees did come with a reputation authority from Jerusalem. Remember, that's emphasized. They have been watching Yeshua's disciples. And they have noticed these disciples that they eat bread. And according to the tradition of the elders, the oral law, not the biblical law, not what Moses received, but what the sages taught, they said they commanded before one eats bread they must first wash their hands and this washing of the hands was a ceremonial washing what was the purpose well remember i shared with you that this portion of scripture has a parallel it is repeated it is told again very similarly in mark's gospel chapter 7 and I call your attention to Mark chapter 7 and verse 4. Why? There is a very important statement. It says, when these scribes and Pharisees, those who follow the traditions of the elders, when they return from the marketplace, they do not eat, meaning eat bread, have a, a meal, unless first, they wash their hands. Why is that? And here again, it has nothing to do with the kosher laws. Presumably, these individuals, obviously, when they ate, they would be eating kosher food. So the ceremonial washing had nothing to do with the dietary laws. What did they have to do with? What I've said several times. The laws of impurity that which defiles a man, that which makes one unclean. And here again, although we have defilement and impurity from a biblical standpoint, this is not dealing with that. It's a different source. And what is that source? Well, remember, when they came from the marketplace, who would be in the market? Also Gentiles, not just Jewish individuals, but Gentiles and the implication here idol worshipers let's get more specific if you look and it's the same issue if you look at galatians chapter 2 beginning with verse 11 we find that that peter went to antioch and there too was paul and paul observed something paul observed that peter would eat break bread with gentiles he wasn't concerned of this this oral tradition these man-made laws he would sit down he did not fear as coming from the gentiles impurity but and here's the key and i would would strongly recommend read galatians 2 
beginning with verse 11, that, that entire passage. What Peter did was this. When the Judaizers came and Peter saw them, he would no longer, he removed himself from eating with the Gentiles. Why? Because under their laws, the Judaizers, this was improper. So here's the view. Gentiles, they have this impurity. That's what the oral tradition taught. The Bible doesn't say that. This is incorrect. But the oral tradition says Gentiles carry with them an impurity. And that impurity, that which is unclean, can defile a Jew. And therefore, in order that this defilement that, that clings to your, your hands, that you don't bring it into your body before eating food, you have to do something. Just like it says here, that you have to wash your hands in this unique way in order to remove this defilement that came from the Gentiles so that you would not digest it. That was the issue. Now, is that biblically true? No, it is not. It is a fabrication of individuals' mind, the tradition of the elders. And notice Messiah's response. I want to go back and read this again. They asked the question, why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders for they do not wash their hands whenever bread they eat? Look at verse 3. Now, verse 3 is a very, very, very important passage. Notice what Messiah says. He also asks a question. And this question that he asks these Pharisees, these scribes, has most significant implications to it. Implications that some are not going to like. Verse 3, But he answered and said to them, why also? Meaning, you're the ones that are really guilty. Guilty of what? Why also do you transgress, and here it is, the commandment of God. Read on. Not only does he say this, the whole verse. Why also do you transgress the commandment of God on account of the, the traditions of your own? Here's what he's saying. And there's no other way to understand this. And as I said, it has highly significant implications for us. Now, I'm Jewish, and I am part of what's called the Messianic movement, Jewish individuals that believe that Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth, is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And more and more of the Messianics, they are studying and embracing these rabbinical laws. And what is Messiah saying here? He's saying this. When you keep these traditions of men, in keeping these traditions, they cause you to forsake the commandment of God. This is serious. This is important. When we embrace as the teachings of God, the laws of man. I'm speaking about spiritual, religious laws. When we take the fabrications of men, their thoughts, their traditions, and we apply them to our life, we are going to find ourselves in conflict with scriptural truth. That's what he's saying here. And that's why he says, why do you, for the sake of, on account of your traditions, why do you transgress the commandment of God. Look now to, to verse 4. For God commanded, saying, and now he's going to give a very significant commandment, one that we all know, one of the Ten Commandments, which is, honor your father and your mother. Now, we know something. We know another commandment, via hafta l'reacha kamoka, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, let me ask you, which is a more difficult commandment? To love your neighbor as yourself or to honor your mother and your father? Well, from my standpoint, it would be 
loving your neighbor. Why? Well, who's my neighbor? Anyone who's near me. Anyone who's in need. I have a responsibility. I may not know them. I may not have any personal feelings towards them. I may have negative feelings towards them. But my parents, I love them. They have blessed me throughout my lifetime. So I want to honor them, respect them, love them, do things for them. That's not a difficult commandment, but here's the problem. When I don't love God, I'm not going to love my neighbor, and I'm not going to honor my parents. It's my love of God that, that, that instills within me this desire to honor my mother and father. And therefore, he purposely chooses this commandment. And notice what he says once more. Verse, verse 4. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother. Also, the one who, and this is literally two words, the word evil and the word for speaking. So saying something evil, and many Bibles interpret it as an idiom meaning those who curse. So speaking evil, cursing your father and your mother. What happens? Well, if you do that, the result, and that's literally what it says, it says death shall be the end. That there's going to be a punishment. What's that punishment? The death penalty. That's what the scripture is saying here from a biblical standpoint. This is serious. So this is clearly one of the big commandments. Now all commandments are important, but Obviously, one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father, your mother. One who does not, he says, the end, he has to die, be put to death. But notice something. Look now to, to verse 5. But you say, who's that? This is the oral tradition. He's not speaking simply to this handful of scribes and Pharisees that came. When he says you, he's referring to their traditions, the oral law, the traditions of the elders, they have something. And what is that? They have a way of kind of skirting around the word of God, the commandments of God. And what is that? Well, notice what it says here. But you say, if one should say to his father or mother a gift. Now, what is that? This relates to something that has been set apart. Now, we know the scripture says, if you make a vow, you should honor that vow. You shall do that. You take an oath, you carry it out. So this is what the oral law said. If, if I had something, and let's use a kind of a silly example. I have money. I want to take a vacation with that money. But I know my parents need some help financially. So what do I do? I proclaim. I designate. I sanctify that money for a purpose in this case my vacation now my parents need it my father asked me for help and i said oh i'm so sorry dad i can't i would be breaking the law if i gave you this money because it's already been designated and i need to pay my vow of course who's the recipient i am and what messiah is saying is this you're not wanting to serve god you're not wanting to honor god you're not wanting to do what i've commanded you to do you even look for a way to circumvent what? Honoring your father and your mother. It speaks about how far removed they are from the love of God and the word of God. That's what he's saying here. That which can be a benefit. And if you read on in the last part of, of this verse, verse 5, it says that what is from you that could have been profitable to them. You don't give them because you say it's a gift. It's already been designated. And he says, also, you do not honor your father and his mother. And in doing so, what happens? Verse 6, and you make void the commandment of God. And here's the second time, on account of your traditions. And here's the real issue. They are utilizing the teachings of man, their own traditions. Why? Because they do not want 
to do the will of God. And whenever we begin to add to Scripture, what we're really doing is subtracting from Scripture. Why? We add things so we can eliminate that. We don't have to apply it to our life. And we're going to see undeniably as Messiah goes on in this passage that it shows us that he's speaking about that which defiles a person. And what's going to be the real takeaway for us? That which defiles us is not something on the outside, but what he's going to teach us is this. It's something on the inside. And if we want to have, and this is going to be where we begin next week, if we want to have our hearts established, if we want to have a godly perspective, who should we look to? We should look to the prophets. Why? Because the prophets... They spoke in a very clear manner about the, the desires of the flesh. The prophets, their primary responsibility, what they shared was that of a message of repentance. Their purpose, the purpose of the prophets was to reveal the word of God, not the traditions of man, but the word of God in order to accomplish something. To turn the people back, that's what repentance is. Back to who? Back to God. See, here's the simple truth. When a person loves God, they're going to want to honor God. They're going to want to apply God's instructions. Why? See, I know something. I know God loves me. How do I know that? Because he sent his only son into this world to die for me. I know that God has that which is good for me. And how do I become a recipient of that which is good? Very simple. I obey his instructions. Not because if I don't, there's a punishment. That's not my concern. My concern is not punishment. My concern is what? Honoring God, pleasing God, glorifying God, doing what he says is right. Because just like an earthly son wants to bring glory to his father, so many young men, they're dying for their father's approval. They want that. Well, we should want our heavenly father's approval. He loves us, but he will approve us. Meaning, well done if what? If we put his truth into action. That's what true faith is all about. Shalom. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.